Good morning and welcome to the United States Institute of Peace and to today's event on the growing importance of NATO's Indo-Pacific partners, views from the region on NATO relations and the Vilnius Summit. The United States Institute of Peace was created by the U.S. Congress in 1984 as a national, nonpartisan public institution working to help prevent, mitigate, and resolve violent conflict around the world. My name is Jennifer Statz, and I'm the director for our East Asia and Pacific programs here at the Institute. We are gathering this morning, just as the NATO summit in Vilnius, Lithuania gets down to business, to focus on the importance of NATO's Indo-Pacific partners, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and the Republic of Korea. The leaders of these four countries will be joining the NATO heads of state and government for a meeting of the North Atlantic Council tomorrow. But before that happens, we are going to take some time this morning to discuss the significance of their presence at this NATO meeting and the broader context of relations between NATO and these Indo-Pacific partners. And for today's event, we're honored to welcome some very distinguished guests to our panel. From the Embassy of Japan to the United States, Charge d'Affaires Tamaki Tsukada. From the Embassy of New Zealand to the United States, Ambassador Bede Corey. From the Embassy of the Republic of Korea to the United States, Deputy Chief of Mission Chungu Kim. And joining us soon from the Ambassador, I'm sorry, from the Embassy of Australia to the United States, Ambassador Kevin Rudd. And moderating today's discussion will be former U.S. Ambassador to Afghanistan and Lieutenant General Carl Eikenberry whose last military assignment was as the deputy chairman of the NATO Military Committee in Brussels. I think you'll agree that we couldn't have asked for a better group of people to join this conversation today. And I want to thank all of you for joining us. Uh, we're honored that you took time out of your very busy schedules to be with us this morning. Now, Vilnius marks the second year in a row that the leaders of Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and the Republic of Korea have joined NATO counterparts at an alliance summit. These countries have enjoyed fruitful and constructive relations with NATO for a number of years, but the recent spotlight on these partnerships comes amid geopolitical changes that are bringing the Euro-Atlantic and the Indo-Pacific closer together. Among them, of course, the return of strategic competition to the international system, the threat to the rules-based international order from Russia's war in Ukraine, strategic challenges posed by a more assertive China, and urgent transnational problems like climate change and emerging and disruptive technologies. As NATO's Secretary General has said, what happens in Europe matters for the Indo-Pacific, and what happens in the Indo-Pacific matters for Europe. Now, USIP has been exploring this topic over the last year through an expert working group on NATO and its Indo-Pacific partners, and that report will be available later this fall. But in the meantime, I'm very excited that we have a chance today to hear directly from the Indo-Pacific partners um, to help us here in Washington and everyone want, uh, watching online better understand their perspective on these very critical issues. So we have a lot to cover and a fascinating discussion ahead of us. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you to our panelists. And with that, Ambassador Eikenberry, I will turn the floor over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know that uh, I know that I speak. Uh, for all of us here on the stage today when I express our, our gratitude to you, Jennifer, uh, for your words of introduction and also to the United States Institute of Peace, uh, so ably led by Lise Grande uh, for hosting this event today. And we'd like to thank, as Jennifer did, all of you both here physically and those uh, virtually for making time to uh, join us. So this morning, as Jennifer had indicated, we're going to explore the growing importance of NATO's Indo-Pacific partners, not from the perspective or the vantage point of Brussels <clears throat> or the 31 NATO capitals right now, maybe soon 32 capitals, but we're going to do this from the vantage point of the Asia-Pacific region, from the AP4, from Australia, Japan, Korea, and New Zealand. We couldn't do better in this regard than with the distinguished diplomats that I have uh, sitting here to my right. All representative of the AP4 countries. It's a very eclectic group. If you uh, look at their uh, bios, I'll make note of those uh, at several points during our discussion today. They all have very diverse experiences nationally and internationally, but what they do share in common is a really keen, deep understanding of international security issues. 
So as Jennifer had already mentioned, NATO relations with Canberra, Tokyo, with Seoul, and with Wellington, these are not new developments at all. Uh, there's more or less institutionalized developments that exist between our AP4, uh, going back in the case of New Zealand to 2001, in the case of Australia and Korea to 2005, and in the case of Japan, informally, even in the 1990s, and then more institutionalized, beginning in the year 2010. In fact, the NATO and what we call the AP4, they actually started to have intermittent meetings going back to 2016, where the discussion point, understandably, at that time was Korea. And then these meetings became more frequent, beginning in 2019. But it was clearly Russia's brutal, illegal invasion of Ukraine in February of 2022 that marked an inflection point in the AP4 relations with NATO to varying degrees. And this is evident if we consider right now, at this time, we're in Vilnius, it's 5.30 p.m. and the first day of the 33rd NATO summit of heads of state of AP4 are all there in Vilnius, and as Jennifer, you had said, the uh, second year in a row now, beginning with Madrid last year. So as NATO Secretary General Jen Stoltenberg wrote in an article that, it that was published in Foreign Affairs just yesterday, setting up the, uh, setting up the uh, summit, he wrote, uh, <laughs> Ambassador, welcome. So as, uh, as the Secretary General Stoltenberg wrote in his foreign affairs article that appeared yesterday, quoting, as autocratic regimes draw closer to one another, those of us who believe in freedom and democracy, we must stand together. NATO is a regional alliance of Europe and North America, but the challenges that we face are global. That is why I've invited the leaders of the European Union and our Indo-Pacific partners Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and South Korea to join us in Vilnius. We must have a common understanding of the security risk we face and work together to strengthen the resilience of our societies, economics, economies, and democracies. So then we'd like to explore with our four guests here this morning several aspects of this question, the growing importance of NATO's Indo-Pacific partners in this topic. These include, but are no means limited to, number one, how and why Russia's brazen violation of the UN Charter have changed your government's thinking about your respective current and future relations with NATO. Two, how more concretely do your nation's defense establishments and your armed forces hope to benefit from closer NATO ties? Three, although AP4 ties with NATO are not collective, they're direct from each one of your four capitals to Brussels. Is there now or in the future potential for these ties to directly or to indirectly usefully facilitate security cooperation with each other? And then fourth and finally, how do you respond to those who are skeptical of the value of any or all AP4 associations with NATO, whether in Beijing, whether in Paris, or perhaps within your own countries? Or one might ask, since NATO was established as a transatlantic alliance, what business does it have in NATO, in uh, Asia? So if agreeable to our guests then, let's proceed in allowing each one of our four guests here on the uh, stage to offer five to seven minutes of opening remarks on why your country is interested in engagement with NATO and why your leaders have gone to NATO summits now for the past two years. Then we'll have a more focused discussion among ourselves and then most importantly, it take questions from the audience here in person or virtually. And Jennifer, it's my understanding then that your team is going to, will come up with cards and collect questions and uh, I'll go from there. Okay, so then let's begin with uh, brief remarks from our guest and we're going to use the English alphabet protocol uh, beginning with Australia's ambassador to the United States, Kevin Rudd. I've known Ambassador Rudd now for uh, some years, and I continue to be ever more surprised uh, as I prepare for an event like this to learn more about this amazing 
life of public service that he has lived. So most recently, I learned that back in 1981, when Ambassador Rudd was a young Foreign Service Officer for the Australia Ministry of Foreign Affairs, he served as the third secretary in the Australian Embassy in Stockholm, 1981 to 1983, and he wrote reports on Soviet gas pipelines and European energy security. And I'm sure there's some report that he wrote back at that time that predicted that Sweden would be joining NATO uh, in this year. But uh, seriously, Ambassador Rudd, uh, what you've done on the international stage, what you've done on your national stage is extraordinary. Uh, I know that the audience is greatly looking forward to your comments. Thank you very much uh, for the very kind and generous uh, introduction. And sorry f to my colleagues for arriving sl slightly late. Um, going back to uh, 1981, uh, which was uh, a while ago now, um, uh, you're right, I did write a report then about the problem of European gas dependency on Soviet gas pipelines. Um, uh, you're wrong that I would ever have predicted Sweden becoming a NATO member. Uh, in fact, I was, I, the reason I'm late, I've just come from the White House, we're talking to a bunch of folks there. <laughs> And we're talking about this morning's news uh, about uh, President uh, Erdogan finally removing the, uh, the impediment to Swedish accession. And I said to my interlocutors at the, the White House, who would have thought as a third secretary in Stockholm, Sweden, after hundreds of years of uh, cultivated and defined neutrality, and proudly owned, uh, would now be a member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. This was simply inconceivable in the Sweden that I knew. There was not a single constituency in the Swedish Riksdag at the time, the parliament, for anyone uh, to get behind this proposition. So, as they say in history, times change, um, but um, security policy realities have a habit of enduring and becoming more acute. The other thing I remember from those times, Carl, was the fact that um, you had a series of submarine incursions by uh, the Soviets uh, into Swedish waters in the Baltic. And that began a long process of um, strategic reappraisal of, um, of um, Swedish neutrality. And then, of course, uh, what we've seen uh, more recently with the Russian Federation's invasion of Ukraine uh, fundamentally altered the, and finally altered the strategic calculus. So what's the perspective from down under? Uh, people may find it curious uh, that a country so far removed from strategic realities in Europe would be uh, engaged in uh, security developments there. Um, it has a series of antecedents. Um, Carl just said before that in recent years we've begun attending uh, NATO, NATO plus summits. This process really began unfolding, I remember when I was Prime Minister, uh, during the Afghanistan war. And we as um, the largest non-NATO contributor to ISAF in International Security Assistance Forces in Afghanistan, um, were uh, puzzled as to why our friends in Brussels would expect us constantly to lift our national military effort uh, in Afghanistan, and secondly, uh, have us excluded from NATO high policy and security deliberations on the same. In other words, it didn't make sense, and it certainly was unsaleable in the Australian body politic. And so a number of us uh, began to engage in robust Australian style, which is the antithesis of normal diplomacy, um, uh, with our NATO counterparts. Uh, and. Uh, the then Secretary General, uh, copped it from both barrels from myself and our Defence Minister. And as a consequence of that, we began to see the formal collaborative mechanisms for NATO engagement with uh, its uh, Asia-Pacific and now Indo-Pacific partners begin to unfold. So I remember attending as Prime Minister the 2008 um, Bucharest Summit of NATO, uh, where we had the morning session was, should Ukraine be admitted? Um, I was not in that session. The afternoon session with all NATO members present was, what do we do next in terms of Afghanistan together? So this has been un unfolding really over the last 15 years, which brings us to the present. 
Um, I think whether you are a democracy such as ours in the Indo-Pacific region and looking at my friends and colleagues from Japan, from the Republic of Korea and from New Zealand, um, what we face now as a reality is that security is no longer defined primarily, let alone exclusively, by geography. That's the underpinning reality. If I was to say to you that um, cyber attack uh, on... Um, New Zealand and Estonia this morning um, was uniquely the product of a problem in the East Asian hemisphere uh, or in Russia's sphere of influence. Uh, ultimately, we all know as practitioners that this is now a seamless threat uh, across uh, all geographies. And so when you look at the fundamental nature of cyber threat and cyber security to all of our democracies, to our core and critical infrastructure, to uh, the theft of uh, critical defense and other forms of technological um, uh, information, uh, this is now a seamless global threat. So it makes sense as democracies that we now collaborate fundamentally and instrumentally with each other. There's another domain as well. It's called space. Um, and if we think somehow uh, that space domains are unique to geography, then we need to go back and re-examine uh, Galileo's assumptions uh, because uh, that is not the case at all. Chinese-based space systems and um, Russian-based space systems uh, and others who seek to be in space um, represent um, new challenges for all of us globally, not regionally. And so therefore, um, we, our road to discovery of all of these um, trans-regional security threats was, of course, uh, our respective engagement in the campaign against global terrorism, um, but uh, has now evolved in the direction of dealing with these seamless threats. So my final point by way of introductory remarks would simply be this, and I'm mindful of the clock, and I don't wish to um, go over time. Um, is that when we look at strategic realities today, um, beyond cyber and beyond space and onto the physical geography of our respective uh, regions, once again we are dealing with fundamental interlinkages between all of us. The fact that such a huge proportion of global trade goes through the South China Sea uh, to the uh, major economies of Northeast Asia, uh, led by Japan and the ROK, indicates that this is not just a concern for the neighbourhood, it's a concern for the world. If our European friends run out of, um, run out of energy uh, going into the next northern winter, this is not simply of marginal concern to the economies of the rest of the world. It's a fundamental concern because Europe collectively represents uh, the largest economic e entity in the world. Um, and so therefore, geography also is of itself physically now running into its own, shall we say, seamlessness in terms of the impact on all of us. So my final comment from an Australian perspective is why is Prime Minister Albanese this morning in Vilnius in particular, um, and at this NATO summit, and I was speaking to his office this morning, um, uh, it is one, uh, not just the, um, you know, the articulation of uh, democratic solidarity and pan-allied solidarity uh, with Ukraine uh, at a time when Ukraine is under direct threat. Two, there's a material from the rest of us as well. Uh, the Australian government announced yesterday, a uh, day before in Berlin, in a visit there with Chancellor Schultz that we'd be deploying Australian um, um, uh, surveillance aircraft, the, uh, the Wedgetail, f to a six-month rotation in Germany to monitor um, um, the, uh, the, the space in and around the supply routes into Ukraine through Poland. We see that as an act of physical solidarity with, uh, with our friends and partners in Europe as well. But beyond that, again, the supply of other forms of military equipment by Australia into Ukraine. Currently, there's about a half a billion dollars of Australian kit and equipment provided free of charge into uh, the Ukrainians, including a whole bunch of armoured personnel carriers. And so people often say to me, led by the Ukrainians themselves, why are you doing that? Because you're such a long way away. In fact, the Ukrainian foreign minister said to me recently, uh, of all the uh, demonstrations of solidarity 
transport and the provision of material kit and equipment, the thing that surprised them most was coming from the distance of, uh, of Australia. And the answer to that is, uh, uh, and the reasons for it are all of the above. We as a government and we as a country now understand the seamlessness of our security environment. And unless we invest in, therefore, in global strategic stability and invest in the defence of the United Nations Charter, where you've had such a flagrant breach by the Russian Federation's invasion of Ukraine, then if and when security challenges arise for us in our part of the world, uh, then we would stand alone. Therefore, alliances are mutually reinforcing arrangements between us all, um, sometimes causing us to do things and to express solidarity in ways we never dreamt of when these arrangements were set in place. But what animates us is our underlying democratic values and the need, therefore, to take robust measures to defend them rather than just make fine speeches about the same. Thank you. As always. So, Sergei uh, Takata from Japan, uh, I noted when I introduced Ambassador uh, Rudd, I mentioned one of his early postings, and I should highlight here for this audience, one of your early postings was in Moscow from 1999 to 2001. Uh, and many think uh, primarily of Russia as a threat to Europe. But in the case of Japan and uh, shared by, uh, by your partners, uh, Russia poses and has posed a threat to Japan, especially since the end of uh, World War II with the Soviet Union and then transitioning to Russia, uh, disputes over the, uh, the ownership of the Kuril Islands uh, and other factors as well. And then I, I would also note that at the NATO summit last year that your Prime Minister Fumio Kishida famously remarked, quote, Ukraine today may be East Asia tomorrow. So I know everyone here is, will be very interested in your remarks. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Um, is, is the mic on here? Okay, good. Um, thank you, Ambassador Eichenberg, uh, for that introduction. And I'm very glad that I uh, have this privilege to speak on this very historic day, um, on the eve of the Vilnius uh, NATO, well, actually today, yeah, Vilnius NATO um, summit and um, on the topic of uh, AP4. Um, you're right. Um, I did serve in Moscow uh, a couple of years. And for what it's worth, maybe I have a very uh, tiny sort of window where I could uh, speak something about NATO um, and its uh, relevance to the Indo-Pacific from that angle. But frankly, um, I must admit, I, most of my time in the Foreign Service, I did uh, mainly economic trade and uh, development cooperation. So perhaps today I will talk more from a generous, generalist perspective uh, about how Japan sees uh, the development uh, in this area. Uh, i.e. the interlinkage between the NATO community, Euro-Atlantic community, and the Indo-Pacific community. Um, and if I may, I would like to talk a little bit about my personal experience. Uh, when I first arrived in DC three years ago, um, I sensed that there was a kind of gap uh, between the Euro-Atlantic community and the Indo-Pacific community, not just in the diplomatic uh, world, but uh, in the, the think tank or the academia and, and the business, um, there, the, the gap between uh, Euro-Atlantic and the in Indo-Pacific um, communities, both camps competing uh, against each other uh, to get more attention of the uh, Biden administration, um, and uh, still worse, lapsing into a um, negative st spiral, uh, as it were. Um, both camps arguing which is more uh, important, i.e. Russia or China, which is more important or should command a uh, higher priority. And I thought that was wrong, uh, even self-defeating. Uh, we should, if anything, engender a sense of community uh, bound by value and interest because, after all, we are working on the same goal. Um, and. The, the interests and uh, approaches that we are talking about here uh, in the context of uh, security, uh, that transcends uh, geography, as Ambassador Rudd mentioned. 
Of course, geography matters, but increasingly there are areas where uh, our interests and approaches transcend uh, uh, the traditional idea of uh, security. So I think by now there is no doubt, very little doubt, uh, about the interlinkage and the commonality of security interests um, of the two communities in the, uh, the Euro-Atlantic and the Indo-Pacific. Why? Um, quite obvious. Uh, two factors. One, of course, is the uh, evolution or the deepening of the Russia-China uh, strategic uh, partnership. And, of course, uh, most uh, starkingly uh, evident uh, development is the Ukraine war. Um, and I, um, this morning, I just browsed through the, the, the recent uh, NATO strategic concept paper, and I noticed this reference. The theaters, oh, the threats we face uh, currently are global and interconnected. And I think this uh, captures the, the fundamental uh, reason why our two communities are so uh, bound uh, closely. Uh, and, of course, the blatant violation of international law and norms, uh, the unilateral aggression by Russia and the attempt to change the uh, status quo by force. That, of course, uh, is uh, the reason why all, uh, we are all united against, this, um, uh, against uh, Russia. Uh, and uh, there is also recognition uh, amongst all the players that the Russia-China partnership Will, is going to stay for uh, the foreseeable future. And the reason why Japan supports uh, the uh, Ukraine war efforts and participate in the economic sanctions against uh, Russia is not because we are asked to participate, it's in our own interest. And there is a strong uh, sense of uh, participation uh, amongst the general public in Japan. Uh, it's in our own interest. And Japan believes uh, defending the existing international order is in our best interest. And of course, as Ambassador Eikenberg mentioned, uh, Japan faces Russia uh, geographically uh, on the far east side of the continent. Uh, we have an unresolved uh, border dispute with Russia for almost 80 years, which has denied us peace treaty with uh, Russia uh, to settle uh, World War II. Uh, and, of course, Japan confronts pressure from China on a daily basis in the East China Sea. People talk a about, lot about the South China Sea, but in fact, there is also, also the East China Sea question. And I would uh, advise you to look at the map very carefully. There are seas apart between uh, East China Sea and uh, South China Sea. Um, so, um, altogether, um, I think there's no doubt that there is a growing sense of uh, commonality of our interests and approaches and uh, uh, through this Russia-China uh, collaboration and uh, the awareness of the, uh, the transboundary uh, threats that we face, uh, cyber, um, uh, critical emerging tech, space, maritime question, disinformation, and so on. Um, and another important factor which I think uh, Europeans or the Euro-Atlantic uh, community is beginning to realize is that Russia's war efforts in Ukraine is only sustainable if China continues to support Russia. So uh, there is a, has been a recent talk about uh, NATO opening its uh, Far East outpost Far East outpost in, in, in Tokyo, and for good reason. Uh, NATO has uh, interest in monitoring and, if necessary, uh, check Chinese behavior uh, in the interest of NATO. Um, <coughs> so, uh, and of course, uh, this is not ha going to happen overnight, it's going to take some time, but there is a natural uh, sort of coming together of our minds and interest uh, in this area as well. So our approach to security um, in the Indo-Pacific will basically be uh, based on, on, first and foremost, on the U.S.-Japan alliance, bilateral alliance arrangement. But on top of that, we think that there is a kind of multi-layered web of uh, bilateral and uh, minilateral uh, cooperation, such as the Quad, 
uh, US, Japan, Australia. US, Japan are okay. Japan, Australia, Japan uh, are okay. Japan, New Zealand, and, uh, and the rest. So this together um, uh, with a greater level of NATO engagement uh, in the region will contribute we believe will contribute greatly to the peace and stability of uh, the Indo-Pacific. And uh, that, I think, would be uh, the, the basis of uh, how we approach uh, this question of the growing, uh, the convergence of the interests between the two communities. It's got a very well spoken. Thank you very much. So now we turn to the uh, Republic of Korea and uh, Deputy Chief of Mission uh, Kim. You have had a remarkable series of assignments with respect to uh, international security and to secure, uh, Korean security issues. So you've served as the ROK Presidential Secretary for Peace Planning. You've served within the uh, Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs as Director General for Foreign and National Security Policy. And uh, several years ago, you were in Honolulu as the uh, Consul General, enjoying better weather than Washington, D.C., but having uh, very close relations with the United States Indo-Pacific Command. And I wanted to uh, tell you, Deputy Chief of Mission, I just uh, had a visit there in May, and uh, your reputation and legacy uh, lives on. So uh, I know we will all welcome very much your opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Kimberly. Um, he mentioned about the uh, life in Honolulu. Um, I, I'm not supposed to talk about the beautiful ocean or you know, wonderful landscape. But I want to mention is that in Honolulu, we have only five consulate generals. These P4 plus the Philippines. These are only five. And they are all the, the alliance of the United States. And these P4 countries work together for the betterment of the security and safety in the, in the Pacific. Uh, I want to reiterate the importance, the strategic importance of uh, the locational importance of Hawaii in the Pacific. So these four countries all always gather together to talk about China, Russia, and how to defend the democracy and free world against some, 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 some big powers from the north. So I learned a lot in, in, in there. Uh, I made friends with a couple of uh, admirals and generals. And um, well, that's it for my, my, my life in Hawaii. Um, uh, for Koreans and the Korea, uh, Europe about until a decade ago, uh, Europe is a far away wonderland where you know, Eiffel Tower, Roman churches, and Buckingham Palace sits and popped up a lot of mermaid swims. <laughs> but because of the drastic change of geopolitics and for the needs of uh, solidarity among the free democracies, uh, there was a, it was a high time to have more allegiance and solidarity between European, in, uh, between Indo-Pacific, you know, power and um, Euro-Atlantic uh, power. So this is a very high time to talk about uh, solidarity among Indo-Pacific and the EU and NATO. Um, well, my, my, my special thanks to uh, President uh, Grande, uh, Dr. Stas, and uh, Mr. Akinberry again, and for organi organizing this wonderful event. On the occasion of the NATO summit in Vilnius today, I wanted to provide some background on Korea's foreign policy and our history of cooperation within the NATO and AP4. As described in our National, National Security Strategy 2023, Korea's foreign policy is rooted in the notion that the world is at an inflection point of history. For the past decades, the rule-based order has been the bedrock of stability and prosperity for the globe, with ongoing trends of global, glo globalization, democratization, and innovation. However, the conflict in Ukraine and economic coercion 
came to represent a significant challenge to the existing view. At the same time, the world is facing transnational threats like the pandemic, supply chain disruptions, AI, and other emerging threats. Also, we must not forget the threat posed by North Korea with the increasing nuclear and missile capabilities, a topic I will visit later. Such challenges often necessitate reorientation of one's foreign policy. In our case, Korea has put forward a new vision of a global pivotal state with an emphasis on freedom and solidarity. Korea has upheld the idea of freedom and liberal democracy for the past 70 years. Thanks to this, we were able to achieve the status of the 10th largest economy now. And here, NATO and AP4 are important partners of Korea who share the universal values of freedom, democracy, human rights, and rule of law. With them, Korea is committed to supporting the rule-based order together. When it comes to Korea-NATO ties, great tries, tries have been made since Korea became NATO's global partners in 2006. The Madrid summit last year holds a special significance as the first time that a Korean president was invited. The detailed plans for the future will be made clear later, but President Yoon gave some clues on our shared goal of cooperation in his speech in Madrid last year. That no single country can take on complex security challenges alone today. And that our cooperation with NATO will contribute to inter-regional solidarity for universal values. As a sign of our enhanced commitment, we also established a permanent representative to NATO headquarters. Currently, Korea-NATO cooperation is focused on expanding joint response against emerging security threats, such as in cyberspace and new technologies. NATO's agenda for cooperation with AP4 is also in progress, featuring cyber and hybrid threats, climate change, and maritime security. Meanwhile, Korea also concluded the ITPP, that was actually today, which will include new areas of cooperation such as public democracy and women's empowerment. <coughs> In the summit, one of the most prominent topics would be Ukraine. Korea has long sided with the allies and partners for an end to Russia's invasion so that peace returns to Ukraine immediately. Going forward, Korea plans to continue to assist Ukraine in many different capabilities. Pivoting back to our own region, the strategic importance of the Indo-Pacific needs no further elaboration. This is home to 65% of the world population and 62% of global GDPs, a critical maritime trade route and the center of semiconductor and other industries of importance. In this, pain, in this vein, AP4 is a community in which we can work together for our shared value, and we look forward, we look forward to hosting the new rounds of AP summit, AP summit tomorrow. Since we first met last year at NATO, the four countries have continued high-level talks and the vice minister meeting in January was joined by the EU as well. All of these highlights Korea's commitment to the values of freedom, peace, and prosperity as described in our own Indo-Pacific stretch ever of first initiative, first ever revealed last year. Lastly, on the challenges posed by North Korea, we believe that the world must come together to issue a firm warning that there is nothing to be gained from sticking to the path of provocation. 
Today, our approach to North Korea would be best summarized at the three Ds. Deterrence against nuclear threats, dissuasion from continuing nuclear development, and three, dialogue as a means to achieve denuclearization. Meanwhile, North Korea's human rights remain in a, a dire situation as well. And we need to continue to speak up for the people of North Korea to make a positive difference. In closing, our foreign policy approach to the new security environment is corporate diplomacy with an emphasis on solidarity. The state visit of President Yoon to Washington in this April represented, represented a drastic upgrade of the alliance to address many complicated issues. We also opened a new era of cooperation with Japan. And our long-standing friendship and cooperation with Australia and New Zealand are growing stronger as well. To reiterate, Korea is, a commit, Korea is committed to continuing efforts to promote, to, to promote freedom, peace, and prosperity of the Indo-Pacific and the world along with NATO and the AP4 countries. Um, this is not an uh, agenda here, but I dare to say, I you know, strongly, hopefully, happily say that this year is genuinely the year one of the true cooperation among three countries, Korea, Japan, and United States. So this is also a, another symbolic gesture and token of our democracies to show freedom, to show solidarity and allegiance to the whole world. And I want to uh, welcome, even though we are not a you know, member of NATO, I want to say welcome to Sweden. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, and very, very insightful. Um, so, uh, Ambassador Corey, uh, we've talked uh, with our uh, three colleagues here about uh, previous assignments, and uh, for yourself, you've had formative assignments in the United States, Europe, Southeast Asia, Australia, and uh, both service in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of National Defense, making you very well suited for today's discussion. And we just uh, reconnected and found out in 2001 that uh, Brigadier General Carl Eikenberry had the honor of escorting Prime Minister Helen Clark to Arlington Cemetery shortly after 9-11, and a, a junior officer in the embassy was in her uh, entourage there, so great to reconnect. You've got to, you know, in a way, you've got the most challenging task of the uh, four of the AP4 in providing a rationale now for New Zealand's relations with NATO, because uh, if you're looking at distance from the AP4 to Brussels, you win. You're at 11,626 miles. You outdistance Australia by 1,244 miles. You're located almost halfway around the world from uh, Brussels. And I did want to uh, highlight that uh, your former Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern at the NATO summit in Madrid last year, she interestingly said, I quote, New Zealand is not here to expand our military alliances. We are here to contribute to a world that lessens the need for anyone to call on them. So we welcome your remarks. Thanks very much, Carl. Uh, great to be here this morning uh, on the mileage thing. It's good to find a, another domain where New Zealand beats Australia. Uh, but <laughs> whether whether distance from Brussels is, is quite the victory that we're seeking uh, is, a, is another matter, but, <laughs> but, uh, but, but more seriously, I think as you've heard from uh, the panel this morning, um, contemporary security challenges collapse mileage uh, and that distance is becoming less, less relevant. Um, but many thanks to, to you uh, and to the USIP for convening this, this very important um, event so timely, as everybody has said, with our four leaders uh, about to attend a session of the NATO summit in Vilnius. And I thought I'd begin by, um, in, a, in a sense, acknowledging my colleagues on the panel because of, as they've all said in, in various ways, or acknowledging the countries they come from, uh, it is not some sort of accident that it is these four countries that are engaging uh, with NATO and that NATO is in turn engaging with 
um, for New Zealand, uh, Australia is our, our ally and our closest friend. Japan and Korea are very important regional partners with whom we're developing um, you know, in increasingly close and intimate relationships. We all have a long but growing history of security cooperation in our region and share very deep interests in a, in a secure, open, peaceful and prosperous Indo-Pacific and more widely uh, a, a secure, open, peaceful and prosperous Euro-Atlantic area as well. Similarly, New Zealand and NATO are closely like-minded partners with a strong commitment to what we call the rules-based order and to established values and norms. And for that reason, we very much welcomed the invitation to attend the Vilnius Summit as we did last year in respect of the Madrid Summit. And our now former Prime Minister's attendance in Madrid last year was an opportunity, obviously, to underline our perspectives on on the same issue that everybody has raised this morning, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which in company with NATO and with our friends here, we un unequivocally condemned and condemn. But of course, our presence at the summit last year and again this year reflects the global consequences, um, and I think Kevin said it first, of what were once seen as regional security challenges. Um, there is a continuum, if you like, between the security of the two regions, I like the word that Kevin used, a seamlessness, a growing seamlessness. And this is shown in distant countries like New Zealand contributing to the defence of a far off land such as Ukraine. And it is shown, of course, in NATO's growing interest in our region. As others have said, our relationship, and as, as Ambassador Eikenberry said at the beginning, um, our relationship with, uh, with NATO is not new. It dates back over 25 years. might surprise some people um, here today that we first deployed on NATO operations in 1996 in Bosnia-Herzegovina. And of course we had, um, as, as, um, as Carl well knows, we had security forces in Afghanistan for over 20 years as, as part of NATO's ISAF there. At a very practical level, um, I might add that much of the New Zealand Defence Forces equipment is built to NATO standards and our doctrine, training, tactics and procedures are all influenced by NATO's practice. And that's very important, that kind of engagement with NATO helps ensure that our military remains interoperable with partners and that it can maintain high levels of capability. Obviously while we have, as I've said, engaged with NATO for many years, Russia's actions over the last 16 months in Ukraine and their consequences for international security and stability, including that, as others have said this morning, for our region, have galvanised this relationship. Russia's disregard for the UN Charter, for international law, poses what we would see as the most acute threat to the international rules-based system since the Second World War. So we stand with NATO, the Allies and our partners condemning those actions in the strongest possible terms. As a result, we made a, a number or continuing to make a number of significant contributions to the defence of NATO of both a military and other kinds. Um, I won't detail those this morning. But doing so reflects what we see as the global implications of Russia's invasion, which in addition to posing a challenge to the rules-based system, also has serious consequences, as Kevin said in his presentation, for the global economy, for fuel, and for food prices. Strategic disruption, though, is not confined to the consequences of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. As Prime Minister Ardern, then Prime Minister Ardern said in Madrid last year, in our own neighborhood, we see the mounting pressure on the international rules-based order. We see attempts to disrupt and destabilize. Separately, she said, China has become more assertive and more willing to challenge international rules and norms. So all these developments are going to shape our relationship with NATO and with our Indo-Pacific partners. And this is only going to become more important as we look out to a world where challenges to that order, to the rules-based order, coercive behaviours, uh, malicious cyber activities, disinformation, foreign interference, uh, disinformation, I'm sorry, foreign interference, emerging and disruptive technologies and the impacts of climate change are all significant challenges and all in various ways have a globalised and not a regional dimension. And they all undermine the international order 
in different and dangerous ways. Coming back to the IP4, obviously we welcome NATO's engagement with its partners uh, from the region based on exchanging insights and engaging on common security challenges. I thought it was worth um, uh, noting the um, you know, comments by a NATO official at the Shangri-La Dialogue recently, um, and to paraphrase him, you know, he said uh, NATO is not, is not coming to the region um, you know, to set up a new alliance structure or to somehow deploy, it's coming to the region to engage with it and to share insights with it, and I think that's important. At last year's summit in Madrid, um, NATO itself highlighted specific issues for that kind of engagement, um, cyber, new technologies, maritime security, climate change, and these all align well with our own strategic priorities and interests. At the same time, let us remember that NATO has been clear that it is, of course, primarily a Euro-Atlantic alliance, and our own priority will continue to be the Indo-Pacific and, of course, our home region of the South Pacific. And while we have many interests in common with each of the partners, they will have their own bilateral priorities for engagement with NATO and have established bilateral mechanisms for that. But this new format, as I and others have already said, is a very valuable means for dialogue with each other. And I'll just ling briefly linger on that point. Um, the, the creation of the, of the IP4 um, as, a, as an entity that engages with NATO has also nascently um, created an entity which is the IP4 meeting among themselves. So the four leaders of the four countries met separately in Madrid last year. Uh, vice ministers and their equivalents of defence met, I think, in Tokyo earlier this year. Uh, the four IP4 foreign ministers met with Secretary General Stoltenberg in Brussels uh, earlier this year. And so it's become a forum and where it's enabled or helped enable a forum where, where we talk about those, those important issues among ourselves as well as with NATO, whether that's the implications of Russia's aggression against Ukraine, climate change, uh, or, or efforts to strengthen the resilience of our own region. We, we engage regularly with these partners um, outside of the NATO context, uh, given our shared interest in shaping a, a peaceful, open, prosperous Indo-Pacific and engaging with them, with, with these close partners, is an opportunity to talk about a broad range of issues and exchange perspectives. As I've said, not always tied directly to NATO. Thanks very much again for the opportunity to talk to you this morning. Thank, thank you, Ambassador. Superb insights. So yeah, actually, you've set up then a, uh, a good question, I think, for our group up here. And that is uh, to drill down a little bit on what are the interests and in business of NATO in the Asia-Pacific region. You know, it's very interesting to note, and I think uh, Deputy Chief of Mission, uh, Kim, you'll appreciate this, that if we look back in history, NATO was established in 1949, and then we had the Korean War break out in 1950. It was actively fought through 1953. What is underappreciated is that the Korean War itself had an impact then on the more rapid development of NATO as dots were connected between what was going on in the Asia Pacific region and uh, Europe. But regardless, that was, that was 70 years ago. Um, and so some, most especially China, have termed NATO as a Cold War relic without relevance in Asia. Indeed, the current uh, PRC envoy to the United Nations, Ambassador Zhang Jun, uh, he said during a speech at the United Nations in June last year, I quote, we urge NATO to learn its lessons and not use the Ukraine crisis as an excuse to stoke worldwide bloc confrontation or a new Cold War, and not to look for imaginary enemies in the Asia Pacific or artificially create contradictions and divisions. We firmly oppose certain elements clamoring for NATO's involvement in the Asia Pacific, or an Asia-Pacific version of NATO on the back of military alliances. The long outdated Cold War script must never be reenacted in the Asia-Pacific. And I take it that he's not in favor then of this. Um, Ambassador Rudd, uh, in addition to uh, 
being a statesman, a diplomat, and a national leader, uh, you also are, uh, have a considerable expertise in China, one of the most preeminent scholars, in my view, on China. So I'd like to uh, start uh, with you then. How do you respond to Ambassador Zhang Jun? Well, that's interesting. The, um, uh, the Chinese have an expression. Any Chinese speakers here in the room? Uh, it's called Hu uh, Shuo Dao. Uh, which is, uh, we don't agree with that. Uh, or rubbish. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I think there are simply, there are, the ambassador's doing his job as the uh, Chinese PR to the UN. Um, but uh, two points simply need to be made. One, which relates to the United Nations and the centrality, therefore, of international law. Um, our friends in China need to reflect very carefully on uh, the... Permanent Court of Arbitrations determine. Uh, sorry, the um, uh, the um, um, mechanism, the UN mechanism in the Hague, which determined uh, a position based on a submission from the government of the Philippines on the nine dash lines, uh, which underpinned China's territorial claim to the South China Sea. Uh, what the established international legal authority determined was that the Chinese claim was without foundation, without any legal merit uh, under uh, UN law of the sea. So it is important to uh, establish a factual basis for our uh, engagement with um, China, which often says it, it adheres to an international system anchored in the UN Charter as opposed to what it describes as a Western concept, which is the international rules-based order, uh, which uh, they allege is the UN Charter plus American strategic power, that purely within the terms of the UN Charter and the UN system and the UN-based uh, uh, international legal machinery uh, uh, through the uh, UNCLOS arrangements that their claim to this significant piece of maritime real estate um, is without legal foundation. And that is simply a matter of record. Of course, China chooses to reject that fact, and it has done so uh, vociferously and voluminously. But it is a major hole in the, um, the, um, uh, the PRC argument about the nature of the international system that it seeks to um, defend. Uh, it has through the South China Sea achieved one huge carve out. So to my good friend and colleague Zhang Jun, I would say uh, have a close look uh, at the consistency of China's position on that score uh, with what uh, was determined by the appropriate international legal authority on the other. I think the second point in terms of um, his broader position about uh, NATO entering into the Indo-Pacific is simply this. Um, that um, the uh, nature of uh, NATO's um, interest in the Indo-Pacific uh, region has grown over years as as consequent as a consequence of um, the Indo-Pacific's rising economic significance. I think our Korean colleague referred to the numbers just before. Um, also, um, our NATO colleagues and friends see. Uh, a vast array of emerging security challenges in the Indo-Pacific which are of direct and indirect relevance uh, to them. And so therefore, uh, that's important for us to note. And then the final point, I think, in response to our Chinese colleagues' reflection is as follows. Um, that um, the um, view that China has adopted against um, uh, all U.S. alliances as being relics of the Cold War um, has been a long-standing Chinese view um, since the end of the Cold War and prior to the end of the Cold War. Um, uh, and that is, it is universal Chinese political doctrine to oppose any form of alliance with anybody um, other than the alliance which exists uh, between China and the, D and the DPRK. And so, uh, which I would have thought has some Cold War resonances itself. 
So therefore, we simply need to understand this is a long-standing political doctrine of the Chinese foreign ministry. It's used uh, in multiple theatres, whether it's against continuing US alliance structures in Asia or against NATO uh, within its own domain. Remember, China has been critical of NATO's posture in Ukraine, quite apart from NATO's posture or, or future posture in the Indo-Pacific. So this is a long-standing strategic position of the uh, the Chinese um, uh, Chinese Foreign Ministry, um, and I think in these two sets of circumstances, for these two sets of reasons, uh, objective facts fly in the face of the Chinese position. Thanks, uh, thanks so much, Ambassador. So, uh, Deputy Chief of Mission uh, Kim, um, I'd like to ask for your views. You know, I also add that you're a frontline state that's uh, facing a nuclear armed and a very belligerent North Korea. And you're also aware that uh, Pyongyang opposes NATO ties with Asia Pacific countries. Uh, earlier this year, when Secretary General Stoltenberg made a very successful visit to uh, Seoul and then to uh, Tokyo, a North Korean analyst wrote in one of his uh, state newspapers uh, that the Secretary General's trip to Seoul was, quote, a prelude to war and confrontational behavior, bringing, quote, the flame of a new Cold War to the Asia Pacific region. And he went on to condemn Secretary General Stoltenberg as the head of a military organization that turned Ukraine into a theater of proxy war, noting his rival in the Asia Pacific region, which is out of his operational scope, is raising concerns. How do you reply? All right, what, what North Korea tells the world is just like what Chinese tell the world. It's more of a mimic of what Chinese tell to, to, to the world. Um, North Korea has a hundred ways of verbally attack the free world, including you know, South Korea, NATO, EU, and the United States, and AP4. Uh, when they think, when, when they talk about NATO's allegiance of, uh, you know, in the Pacific and Secretary General's visit to Korea and Japan, uh, that is, this is also the, the token of frustration that North Korea has because they are more and more isolated from the outer world. And then um, they had a very good, you know, excuse to show show allegiance with, with Russia whenever whenever there is some, some, some big conflict between between Ukraine and Russia, they always make a statement supporting very, very strongly supporting and, and, and condemning European NATO and that the United States and, and other free worlds. So North Korea's, um, you know, statement and uh, remarks on the NATO's co 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 collaboration or cooperation with the Indo-Pacific is just a meaning, just a meaning of their frustration that we have against them. What is interesting is that North Korea, for the first time, described the Republic Korea as Republic Korea yesterday. Kim Yo-jong, um, Kim Jong, Kim Jong, KJU's, KJU's uh, sister, who is the highest possible ranking person, not an officer, person to say Kim Jong-un, she condemned South Korea and the United States for, for transpassing their own border, which was not true, actually. It's a false disinformation to the world. What was interesting is that she, she picked up the word Republic of Korea, not South Korean puppet or, or Nam Joseon, South Korean Joseon, some, some unofficial language that they use for, for South Korea. Uh, the analysis is going on, and we are working on it, but things one thing that we can think about, why did they say North uh, um, Republic of Korea? It seems that they want to go for a normal country, not an not a entity or other group. They want to show themselves as a very stable, normal country, 
allied with China and Russia so that they can make a more formal and official voice to the world. So when we're talking about the Indo-Pacific Alliance, allegiance, when we're talking about the solid solidarity uh, between the NATO and Indo-Pacific, then they, they, they want to have another chain of, uh, chain of you know, solidarity among Russia, China, North Korea, maybe Belarus. So <laughs> it's, it's getting clearer and clearer and then the world is going more clear grouping between democracy and non-democratic world. That's the most that I can say to you. Thanks. Very, very insightful. Thank you. Um, I'm cognizant of time, and uh, as I understand it, Jennifer, we're going to go to 11.45, and we do want to get an opportunity to hear from the uh, audience, and uh, virtually and physically. So uh, let me ask one more question. Maybe at the same time, your staff can uh, provide, uh, start to provide questions here. Um, <clears throat> Thank you so much. What I'd like to do is uh, ask, uh, lay one question out, and then if any of three colleagues would like to, uh, to uh, take this on. So I uh, mentioned earlier uh, by Ambassador Corey that uh, the nations, uh, uh, the AP4, are all working on what we call individually tailored partnership programs, or ITPP. Count on NATO to come up with uh, a new acronym here. Uh, and this represents a upgrade to a higher form of partnership than already existed with each one of the AP4 countries. And so the basis of this then is that there's going to be a set of documents that are prepared and uh, roadmaps developed. And then the partners will explore collaboration with NATO on such topics as cybersecurity space and fighting disinformation. Indeed, I think you said, Deputy uh, Chief of Mission Kim, that your nation has signed, uh, has got now this uh, document in place. Great. Uh, what I want to do then is uh, ask colleagues here, with, since these are tailored programs, they're not AP4 collective documents, in each one of your instances, can you briefly say uh, what you would then believe would be your defense establishment, your militaries, uh, benefits mutually with NATO that could be achieved here. How would these uh, documents uh, look? And maybe I could start, uh, Ambassador, with you. Uh, thanks very much, Carl. Uh, we have had a long-standing uh, partnership arrangement with NATO, and this year it will transition to an individually tailored partnership program uh, what the exact areas it will cover um, are has yet to be agreed. Um, uh, I spoke in my formal comments noting the issues that uh, NATO had highlighted for cooperation with the Indo-Pacific four countries at large, cyber issues, new technologies, maritime security and climate change. They will align well with, with New Zealand priorities and I wouldn't be surprised if, I, if our ITTP uh, covered uh, at least some of them, but as it's yet to be finalized, I probably can't say any more at, at this at this point. Thank you. Well, yours is uh, signed. Uh, do uh, can you tell us anything about it? Yeah, when uh, my president uh, had a conclusion with uh, his counterpart, uh, it's about uh, five five hours or six hours. So it's a quite brand new brand new you know agreement between NATO and the Republic of Korea. Um, as, as other things go, uh, we want to go first with very, very, very soft issues. Even though NATO is an uh, you know, alliance, military alliance, and Korea has a military alliance with the United States, but it is a very initial stage of birth. So we want to go for uh, soft things like climate change, uh, like uh, um, um, women's empowerment, as I told you before, uh, which is it seems not relevant to, to the uh, security, but uh, women's empowerment is quite a big, big issue in Korea as well. So we want to go for it. Uh, we want to go for public uh, diplomacy, which is, again, a very soft one, but a very important thing that we can learn from the people and the leaders of the country. So we will start with that. That's very okay. helpful, very yep. clear, and uh, thank you for your candor there. Georges, mm -hmm. uh, my understanding is that the Republic of Korea and Australia are probably the most advanced in their discussions of this uh, agreement, but can you give any insights into how your country sure. could look yeah. at this? Um, I think 
There was an important announcement uh, in January this year when Secretary General Stoltenberg uh, visited Japan where we uh, issued a joint statement, Japan-NATO statement, where we identified four areas, uh, critical areas, where we can uh, further explore, uh, deepen our uh, collaboration. One is, of course, cyber, uh, as many commenters uh, have uh, described today, and also space, disinformation, and critical and emerging technologies. But I would say on top of that, um, it, um, we would like to further um, expand our layers of uh, consultations and, uh, um, and uh, discussion, uh, intelligence uh, sharing at all levels, uh, from the ministerial to the working level and uh, d through our um, diplomatic uh, outposts in, in Europe and NATO countries. So um, information sharing, uh, consultations at all levels, that would be also a very important uh, area we would like to strengthen. Sure. Thank you, very helpful. So starting to turn to uh, questions now from the uh, audience. Are we finding a way to get the uh, virtual questions into? Oh, these are, okay. Uh, uh, so to paraphrase uh, from uh, several of these then, we've talked about that the AP4 is not a formal grouping. It's, uh, it's four countries that have direct relations with uh, NATO and Brussels. But NATO has all kinds of uh, formal groupings of countries. There's something called the Partnership for Peace, the Mediterranean Dialogue, the Istanbul Cooperation Initiative. So. Uh, then I'd ask our uh, three diplomatic representatives here this question. As you look at the AP4 as a group now and into the future, is there any merit in making it uh, a more informal organization or even a formal organization? And if you could speculate in uh, Vilnius, what are your four heads of state going to uh, be talking about? And uh, could we start, Charge with you? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I think um, we should not sort of um, over um, overvalue the uh, the uh, importance of uh, kind of institutionalization uh, of of our uh, fledgling or burgeoning uh, collaboration. Um, what is important that we uh, have a sort of mutual interest, mutual engagement in each other's uh, uh, areas. Um, I have this, I always um, um, find the, the analogy of uh, the broken window <laughs> theory, which uh, Mayor Giuliani used to, uh, yeah. to, uh, to espouse when he, he was mayor. Um, the more eyeballs uh, watching <laughs> the area, the better to deter or to prevent crime. I think that was the, the, the core idea <coughs> behind that. And I think that applies to uh, security uh, in general. The more countries who engage in a specific uh, area or domain, the more that can deter uh, malfeasance or malicious uh, behavior. And I think that is uh, the, the value of uh, NATO countries engaging and participating in Indo-Pacific uh, security affairs. So uh, at this stage, I would like to uh, see uh, more general interest of the European countries, NATO countries, uh, engage in the Indo-Pacific uh, situation to understand the distinction between East China Sea and South China Sea. <laughs> no, I'm just joking here. Um, and. Uh, to have that sort of um, wider uh, appreciation of the value of uh, the uh, yeah. convergence of interest between our two communities. Thanks. I will remember the broken window analogy. Uh, Ambassador, uh, your thoughts on AP4? Uh, informal, should become more formal. Uh, what do you talk about? Well, it's early days, isn't it? Uh, we've had one, one uh, uh, at so the summit last year and another one this year. I'm not aware that anyone on either side in, in either, either realm, um, the Euro-Atlantic realm or the Indo-Pacific realm, is talking about formalizing anything. Um, one of our panelists this morning used a word which I thought was, was very apt, um, and that word was community, building a community. And I think that's quite a helpful way to 
think about it um, with habits of dialogue, habits of cooperation, habits of engagement. Um, uh, and I'm pretty confident we can achieve that under the current format um, whereby we're, we are now in, in the process of having had one and nearly two summits. And as I mentioned in my comments earlier, uh, a set of meetings uh, in other formats with foreign ministers or defence officials. And I think that is a good way to, to manage uh, the IP4 concept uh, for now. Thank you. So uh, again, continuing with questions here, Chungu, for you. Um, I'll just read the uh, question, uh, well written. Uh, since the United Nations Security Council is paralyzed, uh, is NATO a better venue to seek support to make real changes in addressing the North Korea threat? In other words, how can NATO help, if at all, with regard to the North Korea challenge? I thought of getting questions about this for, for this former uh, previous speech. Please, please do. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, no, please do if you want. Yeah. <laughs> how can I, how can we do, um, how can I solve the North Korean issues with the help of the NATO? Well, United Nations, um, they made a very strong, the most strong, strongest possible um, sanctions on North Korea. Uh, with the resolution 17, 18, 18 uh, we impose very harsh, very harsh sanctions on North Korea. It worked, but not 100 percent. Just because, not just because, uh, because um, a country unofficially uh, giving them the path. There is a leeway always, and uh, that leeway was made by a country, but that country do not acknowledge what they what that country does. So this is the reality. And how can NATO help us to denuclearize North Korea? Uh, it's a long way to go. I, I really don't have the right answer right now because I didn't even think about getting the question from the audience. Um, the only thing that I can say to you is that what the cooperation with NATO and European countries and other, um, you know, value-shared countries, we can push them in a, in a high, up, up-handed, uh, um, high ethics and high moral way. Well, that's the initial state that the NATO can help us, but I don't know more about it. Yeah, that's it. Let me, uh, let me ask you, though, to, uh, to follow up on the earlier question, too, about uh, the AP4 uh, as a informal or more formal uh, kind of uh, organization. At this stage, what should the heads of state of the AP4 um, be talking about? I, <laughs> I want to echo... Uh, uh, previous speakers on that we don't have any any specific you know time frame for making formal um, this is again this is a community where we can share our opinions and our policies AP4 this terminology is only used related to the NATO um, Korea Japan New Zealand and Australia they are the they are the democracy in the Pacific uh, as Tamaki said before, we have a multi minilateral formula in this region. Three of us, three, three four with uh, Australia, um, US, Japan, Korea, New Zealand, Korea, Australia. So many minilateral fora are now existent. So when you're talking about AP, it's quite artificial. So let me, let me think like, let us think like this. AP4 is a, a, a fora that the like-minded countries can freely talk about our future. That's it for now. 
That's a very good framing, very good framing. Um, I'm going to uh, just give uh, cognizant, we're going to end here in five minutes. I'm going to ask uh, one more question uh, directly to uh, Charge from the audience here, but I'd ask all of you to think, uh, I'd like to turn it to you, each one of you, when we finish for uh, final one minute of uh, remarks. So the question for you, uh, Charge Maki, is that, again, reading, uh, Will the envisioned NATO liaison office that you had uh, talked about that was being uh, recommended by Secretary General Stoltenberg, creation of a NATO liaison office in Tokyo, which as we understand it because of concerns right now at the highest level of the uh, French government, that that will be postponed uh, for further deliberation maybe into the fall or winter. But the question is that uh, if you get there with that uh, office, uh, will this contribute at all in responding to the North Korean threat? And this is uh, from Voice of America. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, well, the question of uh, opening a physical uh, presence in, in Japan or Tokyo, I think that is uh, not uh, an important thing. The important thing is that we um, continue to develop uh, this sort of um, gradual uh, understanding of each other's uh, threat perception and uh, sort of uh, mutual sort of intrusive, I would say, um, um, understanding of uh, each other's uh, policy uh, towards Russia and China and, uh, and, wider, um, uh, and wider region. And um, the, um, uh, the question of opening a office there. Uh, we, we are not a demandeur, so we, uh, of course, welcome that move. Uh, we already have our representation in, in Brussels. Uh, we will open our uh, formal uh, standalone NATO mission next year in, in Brussels. Um, so through that channel and other channels that exist already, uh, I think there is de facto very, very good uh, uh, information sharing. So um, opening of a physical office would be sort of a final uh, step in that uh, build-up. So we are um, very uh, optimistic that uh, our path towards uh, you know, growing and uh, more formalized relationship uh, will happen uh, in the very near future. Thank you. So let's uh, do the uh, final uh, quick round here. and. Uh, Deputy Chief of Mission Kim, if I could begin with you, just any final thoughts you wanted after this uh, great uh, hour and a half of discussion that you wanted to leave with the audience here? Well, thank you again, Carl. Um, this was a very unique, you know, chance and um, um, a very good chance that we can we can talk about AP4. This is my first time to talk about. AP4 among the context of the NATO, but it th that this th this topic was picked by USIP, and the pickup of this A4 itself meant that uh, already uh, in the Pacific and the Euro-Atlantic coalition were made, and we have to go further and further in making our free world be free, more free and uh, more democratic. We are the fully democracy, full, full fledged democracies. So we, we have some, some sort of uh, obligation to, to share our value with the uh, human rights and the uh, importance of life and death to the people who do not sh enjoy. So that was our final game Very and the aim. Very Thank eloquent. You. Ambassador Corey. Thanks very much, Carl. Uh, really, by way of final comment, I just want to thank the Institute for convening this great event and so expertly compared and participated in by colleagues. It's really clear from the actual and virtual attendance that this is a topic of a lot of interest. In some respects, of course, it's also somewhat tantalizing because we're all trying to foreshadow an event that is happening in sort of a matter of hours. So the, uh, <laughs> the, summit, the summit itself, uh, or the section of the summit that engages the Indo-Pacific Four hasn't actually happened. And no doubt we'll all be more enlightened, I think, tomorrow. Um, I, think it I think it occurs, uh, it occurs in Vilnius tomorrow, right? Uh, not, not later today. Um, and so there'll, be, there'll obviously be more to, say, more to say on this. 
and as the community, as I've chosen to call it, evolves, um, we'll look forward to having more discussions with, with all of you. So thanks again. Thanks, Ambassador and Charge, to you. Sorry, just one observation before we close. Um, is the mic on? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, today we have been talking about um, AP, Asia Pacific Four. Um, but I noticed when I was listening to Ambassador Rudd, he referred to AP4 as IP4. And I thought, I was wondering whether it stood for Indo Pacific 4 or the Australian pronunciation. <laughs> well, that was my. I wish he was humble. here to hear oh, that. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, we come to the uh, end of what I think has been just a, a wonderful hour and a half uh, together here. So, uh, a couple of uh, ending points here. First of all, to uh, Lee's uh, Grande, Jennifer, to uh, you and your uh, great uh, USIP team, thank you so much. Secondly, uh, we know that in uh, Vilnius right now and tomorrow, there's uh, history is being written. That's no understatement, or not an overstatement. History is being written. And I have to say, after our discussion up here, uh, I've got confidence it's going to be good history. And then third and last, uh, to include uh, Ambassador Rudd, I think all of you would uh, uh, agree with me that who we have sitting up here right now are superb, superb representatives of their country. Uh, their countries are lucky to have them here, and the United States of America is lucky to have them in Washington, D.C. So a round of applause to all of you.